understand it. Okay, let's start. Yeah, so last yesterday I think we have seen some other stream classes uh, mainly the filter stream, buffer stream, array streams and different different types of streams. Okay. Okay, so message kya aati hai uska? Unable to stream the audio, aisa hai message tha kuch. We are unable to stream the audio, aisa kuch message aata. Okay, let's. Uh, Okay, so let's continue with the other stream classes, right? Uh, in most of the stream classes we have finished. Okay, uh, first thing, let's, uh, I'll just uh, draw the class hierarchy for each of the stream types. And let's see the, look at the class hierarchy for each of the stream types, an overview. So what are all the different classes that we should be able to see here? I need more of the board, so okay. So starting with let's say the output stream, let's see the subclasses of the output stream. And then the input stream. So if we start with the output stream subclasses, we got the output stream class. Yes, what are the subclasses of the output stream class? Yeah, which are the subclasses we have seen? We saw about the first one, we can say is the file output stream. Okay, I'll just put OLS in short. That's the output stream, okay? And I'm not writing the full names. So first is the file output stream. That's a subclass, okay? Then the byte array. Output stream. And the byte array output stream, yeah? Other thing we have seen is we also seen the filter output stream. Yeah. We have also seen pipe stream. Piped output stream. Yeah. It's the piped output stream. Fine. And then we have seen some of the subclasses of filter output stream. Okay, uh, let me put the whole thing. Uh, even those things which we haven't seen. Okay, uh, subclasses of filter output stream. Something which we have already seen. We have seen buffer output stream. And that's one we have seen. We have also seen towards the end, we also saw about the class called print stream. And there's a print stream class. 
Okay. Fine. Then there's something else here which we haven't seen yet. Fine. What we have not seen yet is the class called the data output stream. And just to save the space, I'm doing it like this. Output stream, okay. So we have this class called the data output stream, but something about the data output stream is the data output stream implements an interface. So there is one interface called data output. We have an interface, it's an interface I'm showing with dot it. Okay, so that's one interface called data output, which is implemented by the data output stream. So data output stream extends from the filter output stream but implements data output interface. Okay, now there's something more here. What we have is we have another interface coming up. Uh, we have one more interface in this hierarchy. It's called the object output interface. So we have object output interface It's an interface. The object output is an interface which extends from the data output interface. And then we have a class here <coughs> called object output stream. We have the class called object output stream which in implements the object output interface and it extends from, so let me put it like this, it extends directly from the output stream. So it's a subclass of the output stream. And so object output stream extends output stream implements object output, where object output extends from the data output. Okay, so this is the class hierarchy for the output stream class. Input stream also has a similar kind of a class hierarchy. And these two are interfaces, data output, object output, these two are interfaces. Okay. Fine. So let's now proceed and look at the input streams. It's almost similar. And if you look at input stream, it would be exactly similar thing. Okay. So we have a look at the input stream, the class hierarchy for input stream goes like this. So we got the input stream class. You can almost copy the same thing as it is, replacing out with the in. Okay, and a few additions will will see. Right? The, just a few additions. Uh, so one of the things was the class called the file input stream. And so we have a file input stream extends from the input stream. Then we have the byte array input stream. Again, use the shortcut input stream i and s. Okay, right. So byte array input stream. We have see similar structure. Filter input stream. And very similar class hierarchies, right? And then 
we have the piped input stream and there's still one more which is let me put it here we also have a sequence input stream which again extends from the input stream subclasses of the input stream let's see the direct subclasses of input stream again exactly similar what's the subclass here the buffered input stream we got the pushback input stream We got the data input stream and on similar lines as what was happening there, right? we have our interface here called data input, that's an interface. Right? So our the data input stream extends from filter input stream implements data input when it implements the data input okay and again we have our sub interface which extends from the data input interface we got the object input interface So object input extends from data input and the object input would extend from data input and our class called object input stream and that's a class which implements this but it extends directly from oops, and it extends from the input stream. So object input stream extends from input stream implements object input. Okay, so class hierarchy for input stream is like this. Okay, so let's try to just mark out what all we have seen and what all is remaining to be done from the input stream and output stream point of view. Uh, okay, let's even put the other two things, writer and the reader also. And when this is done, Okay, fine. So let's look at the other two and the hierarchy for the other two. And this just to decide, okay, what all remains to be covered. Okay, the other two will be like this. We have one for yeah, uh, writer. Let's start with the writer class. Okay. The subclasses of the writer. There are many of them. Yeah, which ones? The first one I think we saw was output stream writer. Okay. Output stream writer. OSW. Fine. 
one subclass of the output sim writer that was the file writer yeah the file writer what else output sim writer the file writer then fine file writer extends from the output sim writer Then what are the other things we are seeing? After file related things, we have seen a care array writer. Let me put it here. The care array writer. That extends from the writer. We have a buffered writer extends directly from the writer. We have the piped writer again extends directly from the writer. We have which are the writer? Yeah, which other things we have seen? Buffered writer. We have the filter writer. Okay, directly extends from the writer. We even have a print writer fine directly extends from writer class okay i think there's still one more but that one also directly extends from writer there's also another class here called string writer we also have a string writer yeah this we haven't seen a string writer is yeah something which we haven't seen we can look at that also right so that's a writer class okay fine then coming to the next one which is reader subclasses of the reader yeah first one input stream reader and that's our input stream reader isr i have written and i'll just put short isr input stream reader subclass of the input stream reader which one the file reader the other subclasses of the reader yeah similar things let me put the buffered reader first here okay so i create a symmetrical thing Let's put the buffered reader here. Okay. We have buffered reader. Okay. We got a care array reader. We got a subclass of the buffer reader, which one? Line number reader. Recollect this. We have the line number reader. And here we have got a pipe reader.
we got a filter reader another subclass of the reader subclass of the filter reader push back okay fine those are the reader classes okay so things still pending from all this list okay what are the things pending from input stream and output stream classes the byte streams what remains are the classes for data input stream data output stream object input stream object output stream four things and those are the important things and one thing we missed out was string writer in the writer there is a string writer i think all other things we have covered fine okay string writer is not much that's fine but okay let's first now start looking at the data streams fine we'll cover the data streams today and there are some important concepts there okay and so looking at the data streams So we have examples of. Let's start with the data output stream. What is this data output stream? The data output stream implements it inherits from filter output stream, which is in turn a subclass of the output stream. There are no whatever methods we have in the output stream; those are the only methods which it is inheriting. It adds new methods. Let's see those additional methods. so data output stream constructor yeah okay or methods of yeah what it does it do it implements data output right what are the methods of data output methods of data output those are the additional methods it gets constructor point of view if i find the methods will be from here constructor point of view from for the data output stream the constructor is only one okay so data output stream has a constructor which requires an output stream okay methods from data output now let's look at the additional methods when we understand the methods which it is inheriting so i'm not repeating the methods there are a few methods like those right methods they are also methods of data output and but let's look at what is the main thing about data output data output is giving us all methods which are related to writing the primitive values see suppose you have a int value what's the size of a int value what's the size of int size of the int data type java's int data type what's the size what's the size of int four bytes okay fine we have the right method which can write only one byte takes int as a parameter but it would write only one byte i have a int value right i got a int value uh, here is some destination which i have so i got some output stream here 
it has its own destination maybe it's a file output stream so destination may be a file it could be anything else right some output stream is there if i want to store a int value the four bytes of a int fine then it is in binary form right if i can store the four byte as it is and without converting to asking four bytes binary okay that's what i want to write how do i write the methods in output stream doesn't allow me to do this. Oh, you can write a one byte or you can write an array of a byte or you must have a segment of a byte array. But this is an int value. I want to store the int value, four bytes. Fine. Clear? So what should I do? What is to be done? Yes, if someone says, okay, this is a byte, this is an int value, write it. Yeah, what you should be doing? You will write only one byte at a time if I, fine. And therefore, what you need to do is, yes, first time if you say write, the least significant byte will go. But whether I want to write with least significant first or the most significant first. Accordingly, what I'll have to do is, I'll have to probably shift and mask. Shift the bits and mask them. Mask the last byte and write it out. Shifting, masking, all those things and then writing. Four times, shifting and masking. And that kind of a thing needs to be done. Okay, so instead of doing such things, yes, it can be done. That's fine. What is uh, what has been done? Instead of doing such things uh, uh, to be done by the application developer, it's there in the data output interface. We have methods to handle all primitive values. Yeah, what we have is methods to handle all kinds of primitive values. Therefore, the data output interface provides us with all kinds of methods starting with, so we have methods where the return type is void. Right? For example, we have the method called write byte. Parameter is an int. Only the byte would be written. We have the method called write short. Parameter is an int. Two bytes would be written. We have the method called write int fine again the parameters are int okay all four bytes would be written out okay we got the method called write long parameter is long fine you'll have a parameter of type long here Fine, write long, byte short, int long, then writing four bytes of a float as a float. See, this is overloaded. Understand, this is overloaded to take care of all the primitive types. Fine, like float, yeah, what's the next thing? Double parameter will be of type double. And you can use write care to write a single character the care value or you can also store a boolean <laughs> give a boolean value so any primitive value can be stored and any primitive value the raw byte as it is would be put into the stream right? the destination stream so you can put all your binary data into it now. And it's in binary form now. And the bytes. So when someone says write long, how many bytes? Eight bytes would go. Yeah. Okay, fine. Now over and above these, we have more methods. There are methods to handle strings also. Okay, there are three methods, three ways of handling a string. So we have three methods which will take string as a parameter. Fine, let me show those methods. For example, we have the method called write cares. Parameter is a string. We also have a method called write bytes. What's a parameter? A string. And we also have a method called write UTF, where parameter is still a string. So we have three methods, 
all three accept the string. Three different ways of handling a string. Okay, let's try to understand these three methods. What's the difference between the three of them? When all three, yeah, you give it a string, what goes out? Let's see the difference between three and fine, how the three will get handled. Okay, so let's consider our string. Let's say we have a string. So I might have a string which is a string as simple as hello, right? Suppose I have a string called hello. How many characters are there? Five characters? Okay, fine. When I use the right case, what does it do? I am using right case on a, let's say this is my data output stream, fine. And here is a corresponding output stream. So when I say right case and give it a string hello, right? That's what I have given. So I have given five characters. This is a byte stream, right? So it has to put out bytes. How many bytes will be put there? String made up of five characters. Five care values have to be written. What's the size of a care? What's the size of a care? Two bytes. Two bytes. How many bytes will it write? Only two bytes for hello. Ten bytes. And it should be ten bytes. Two per character. Every character requires two bytes. And because that's your UTF-16. Fine. Unicode characters. UTF-16 characters. Okay. Fine. Now, when that's how write cares behave. Okay, that's what is right cares. Two bytes per care value. Fine. String made up of care values and two bytes. It's storing each and every character. Okay, what does write bytes do? Let's see this. When someone uses write bytes, it converts your care. The string is made up of care values. It converts each of those characters into the default character set. Converts each of those characters into the default character set. Your default character set would be some 8 bit set, character set. Fine. So, if I want to store hello, yeah, how many bytes? How many bytes now? Five characters. In my local character set, how many bytes does it need? 8 bit each. That means how many bytes? Five bytes? It would require five bytes. Each of the characters converted to your local character set one byte per character. Fine. So this would require, if I use write bytes, this same string requires five bytes. Okay. Now let me change the string slightly. Okay. Oh, you have this string called hello. Now instead of the string called hello, suppose I put the string space and then we have. You got what I am making. Oh, there is a space. Oh, I forgot the space. I want to put the space also. Sorry. Bring it again. There is a space and then we have. Yeah. Not so good, but okay. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. How many characters do we have here? This is made up of 1, 2, 3, 4th is the space, 5 and 6. There are 6 characters here. If I use right case, how many bytes? If I use right case, how many bytes? 12 bytes. If I use right bytes, how many bytes? 
6 bytes. That is correct. But what will those bytes be? Does my local character set have these characters at all? So what does it write basically? When I use write bytes, since these characters, right, they are not available in my local character set, one byte character, single byte, maybe it is 88591, Latin 1, in, so these are not Latin 1 characters and therefore anything which is not in the current character set, if I have to convert from Unicode to such a thing uh, into a different character set, this actually would be written out as, the output would be 6 bytes, that is correct, but the bytes will be 2, 3, space, 6 bytes like this. Those characters which do not have a local character encoding, fine in my local character encoding, if they do not exist, they will be converted to question marks. The bytes will be converted to question mark. And so that is what the output you may get. Suppose you are writing on and displaying, yeah, that is a display what you will be getting, okay, clear, the difference between write cares and write bytes. For write bytes, the characters should be belonging to your local, local character set, otherwise you lose them, okay. Now what is this, the third method, write UTF, fine. See, most of the time, you might be having ASCII characters only, right? If it is ASCII characters, write bytes is good because it re requires less space. Fine? Maybe write bytes seems to be good because it requires less number of characters, less number of, less space. Fine? But if I say write cares, oh, each one, you do not lose any data at all, right? But now there is something compromised. Suppose you have uh, something in between like, okay. So what we have here is a method called write UTF. What write UTF does? What write UTF does is whatever string we give, it will be converted into UTF-8 encoding. It will do a UTF-8 encoding of the string and then the converted bytes would be written out. Okay. And we will see exactly what gets written out. But we may here try to understand what is this UTF-8 encoding, how the UTF-8 encoding works, fine, okay. So let us have a look at UTF-8, okay. What is the range for Unicode characters, fine. So if I look at Unicode, now there are two things to look at when I say, fine, uh, if I say UTF-8. There are two things, there are two encodings. One is UTF-8 standard and there is a UTF-8 modified. Okay, there are two encodings, UTF-8 standard and UTF-8 modified. Okay, what write UTF does, it encodes into the UTF-8 modified. Okay, fine, I will explain what is UTF-8 standard first and then there is a small difference between the UTF-8 standard and the UTF-8 modified, we will see what the difference is, fine, and why that difference, okay, why that difference, and then we should be able to understand how the right UTF works, okay. Okay, so what is this UTF-8 encoding about, fine. What is the range for Unicode characters? <coughs> what is the range for Unicode characters? What is the code point range? the numeric range for Unicode characters in hexadecimal. When we look at it in hexadecimal, the hexadecimal range for all Unicode characters is from 0 to 10 0 FF F F. When that is a numerical range for Unicode characters. And it is not just 0 to FF F F, it is not 16 bit. And so how many bits does it require? This highest value, how many bits does it require? Eight bits. Hmm? Eight bits? Eight. How many bits? This is four bits. 
that's another 4 bits, that's another 4 bit, that's another 4 bit, this is another 4 bit and this is a just 1 bit. Fine, 1 requires just 1 bit. We don't need more than how many? 21 bits. So, it's about encoding 21 bits, up to 21 bits. Fine, you don't have any value more than 21. What is 21 bit? What's the highest value in 21 bits? 1 FFFFF. Oh, we have 1 0, but you can't manage in 20 bits. It's more than 20 bits. Okay. When the numerical range is such that it would require at least 21 bits. Okay. Now, what is being, what is this UTF-8 encoding? The UTF-8 encoding, uh, the UTF encodings basically they are variable length encoding. That means we, we don't have the fixed length of the encoded output. A numerical value has to be encoded. A numerical value in this range has to be encoded. But then different ranges result in different number of bytes. What is that 8 in the UTF-8? It indicates a unit size, size of the unit. So, the encoding will always encode in terms of 8 bit values, multiples of 8 bits, 1 8 bit value, 2 8 bit values, 3 8 bit values, 4 8 bit values, something like that. Fine. So, you need multiples of 8 bit values, encoding in terms of 8 bit values. Fine. Some, so, it all depends on what is your numerical value to be encoded. So, starting with the first range, so, if your numerical value, this, this is the whole range which is needed to be covered, okay. So, in this range, if the numerical value happens to be in the range from 0 to 7f, what is 0 to 7f? How many bits? If I, if I know my range is only 0 to 7f, how many bits at the most? Rest of all will be zeros. Most significant bits are zeros. What is 7f? How many bits it is taking? f is 4 bits, 7 is 3 bit, total of 4 plus 3, 7 bits. And this requires only 7 bits. This actually covers all the ASCII characters. ASCII characters are in the range from 0 to 127. That's covered by this. Okay, 127 is 7f. So, if your numerical value happens to be in this range, okay. Now, what I am assuming is, uh, if I look at the whole number, fine, a 21 bit number, you have bits from least significant bit is 0, most significant bit will be bit position 20. Fine. But in this case, since we are only from 0 to 7f, whatever is the numerical range, okay, fine. If any value in this range, it gets encoded as it is in the in the sense that yes, it just requires one unit. The most significant bit will be 0 and your bits position from 0 to 6. Bit 0 to bit 6, just one unit. When I put it a little far, but that's fine. And we'll see. This is requiring only one unit. When things will require more units and I just want to align the least significant bits there. <coughs> Fine. If your numerical range is from, the next range would be 80, 7f is covered, right? So it starts from 80 up to 7ff. 7ff requires 11 bits. So, we need to encode 11 bits now, okay, bits from 0 to 10. So, if it is 11 bits to be encoded, okay, it, it would require 2 units, fine. Yes, the last unit would be having 1 0 in the places and this is bits 0 to 5 will be here and a previous byte would look like this. It would have 1, 1 and 0 in the first 3 bit position and bits from 6 to 10 will be here. And the 5 bits, see 3 bits are 1, 1 and 0 that is fixed. 
So it results in 2 byte encoding. Fine. If the if your range is from 80 to 7 ff, if that's a character, if a, 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 your character happens to be in this range, it requires 2 bytes in UTF-8 encoding. It gets encoded as for the first byte, first 3 bits is always fixed, 110. Whatever is your value, fine, you got values which would have from 0 to 10 bits only. Other bits are all zeros. Okay. So pick up the bits 0 to 5, fit them here. You get one number. Put the other 5 bits here. Fine. 6 bits here and 5 bits here. Here 11 bits have to be positioned here. And you get your number. 2 values, 2 bytes for the UTF-8 encoding. Fine. Encoding for 80 to 7FF. Okay. Then the next one, 800 to FF, FF. If that's your range, it requires how many bytes? 3 byte encoding, where the first byte would have first 3 bits as 1110. Oh, how many bits? How many bits in all? 16 bits. Okay. So, bit position 15, 14, 13 and 12 here. The next byte would be having 1, 0 in the first two positions and then the bits from 11 to 6. Bits from 11 to 6 go here and you got 1, 0 again, bits from 0 to 5. See, it is looking at it like this. Oh, this one, this range requires a 3 byte encoding and therefore, my first byte would have first 3 bits 1, 1, 1, 0. This is the first byte of a 3 byte encoding. See, the first byte has 1, 1, 1, 0 indicating this is the first byte of a 3 byte encoding. This is 102, say it is a continuation byte. 10 always indicates a continuation. It is it can't be the starting one. Okay, 10 is it is a continuation. When this was 110 to indicate first byte of a 2 byte encoding. Fine. In this case, there is only one, right? So that has to be. Uh, if it starts with a 0, if you are, see, you start, look at the bits. Oh, it's, this bit starts with a 0 and therefore this is a single byte. And you won't have just a 0, starting with just uh, the most significant bit as 0 in any other case. If it, the most significant bit is 0, oh, it's a single byte encoding. Fine. If the, if the most significant bit is 110, oh, there is one more byte to be read. Clear? And that should have 10. Fine, clear. And now, what is the next range? 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? The next number after value after FFFF would be this and up to 1, 0, FFFF. Fine, so this is 21 bits. And what should be here? What should be the first byte? First byte of a 4 byte encoding, it requires 4 bytes. So, yeah. What will it have? 1, 1, 1, 1 and 0. Fine. Bit positions 20, 19 and 18. Go here. 20 to 18 is here. Next one is 1, 0. It is a continuation byte. Fine. So, this is from 17 to 12. Then, yeah, this one. Clear? This is how the standard UTF-8 encoding works. For encoding any range, any value in the range from 0 to 10, this is how it works.
ओके फाइन स्टैंडर्ड यूटीएफ एट एनकोडिंग इज ओके फाइन लेट्स लुक एट द डिफरेंस बिटवीन दिस स्टैंडर्ड यूटीएफ एट एनकोडिंग एंड द मॉडिफाइड यूटीएफ एट एनकोडिंग दर टू प्लेसेज ऑफ डिफरेंस हियर वन थिंग फॉर वन डिफरेंस जस्ट लुक एट स्ट्रिंग इन जावा वट इज अ स्ट्रिंग इन जावा इट्स मेड अप ऑफ केयर वैल्यूज केयर वैल्यूज आर ऑलरेडी यूटीएफ सिक्सटीन एनकोडेड इट्स when it's nothing but your utf 16 you won't have the value in the range from the last range would not occur for strings pick up one character you have only 16 bits care values are 16 bit it encodes the care values directly it doesn't do something like this that okay i have got a high surrogate followed by a low surrogate and which is the case for utf 16 when we have a auxiliary character fine so it doesn't combine them and derive this value in this range and then we'll do the encoding no it doesn't do any such thing okay picks up each 16 bit value and does the encoding so the encoding never enters this place so that's one difference we won't have this one okay fine you have encoding only up to this point that's one difference and another difference is uh, many times for communication purpose if you are sending some messages across okay uh, zero you know all zeros is something which is to be avoided okay because zero means okay there's no signal or something right so if someone says oh i am sending data where again all zeros is also part of the data and that then something can go wrong also right so just to keep that in mind so to avoid all zeros what they have done is in the modified utf8 this zero is not here it starts from 1 to 7f and zero is included in the second list that means if you have value zero it has to be encoded in two bytes when so zero gets encoded as 1 1 0 all zeros here 1 0 and all zeros here that would be C zero eight zero in hex, zero would be encoded as C zero eight zero. Fine. So for zero, encoding using two bytes, not one byte. That's the difference between standard UTF eight and the modified UTF eight. Clear on this? UTF eight. Clear how UTF eight encoding works? Okay. Okay, now coming to what write UTF does. Yeah, now back to the stream. Right, what's happening in the stream here? Okay, so as far as the stream is concerned, here is my data output stream. Find the post. That's the data output stream. Here's the output stream. Find it may have its own destination. Fine. Whenever I write any string here, I write a string. Whatever that string may be, okay. What will be done by this data output stream when I use the write UTF method? Fine. Let me take the example of. Let's say someone says, "Oh, I want to write the string hello." How many bytes are there? Five. Oh, five characters, right? Now, if I say UTF eight. these are all ascii characters falling in the first category 0 to 7f range is 0 to 7f one byte so it is encoded into utf8 one byte per character okay how many bytes it has calculated five bytes what goes out here will be seven bytes okay what it is always doing is it will first put out a two byte value saying the length is going to be five and then followed by the five bytes of the input so utf strings are always written with the two byte value for the length of the encoding followed by the encoded bytes fine so it would be like okay so it will put out first two bytes saying oh you have the value 0005 and then this would then be followed by the bytes it would then be following fine the bytes for 
H E L L and O. Yeah, those would come later. Fine, that's what goes. Okay, fine. The length of the angular, there are five bytes, so put the value five in two byte value, a two byte value for the length of the encoding, and then the encoded byte should follow. That's how the right UTF works. Yeah. Or example, uh, uh, if we look at the other string, what was that other string? Yeah. If this is the one to be written out, each one of these requires three bytes. How many bytes will go out? Three plus three plus three plus one. 9 plus 1, 10 plus 3, 13 plus 3, 16 plus 2, length of the encoding. So, it says 16, it puts a length 16, the value 16 in 2 bytes and then the 16 bytes should follow. So, total bytes which move out will be 18. And when I say write UTF, 18 bytes will move to the, will be sent to the output stream. Clear on this? Clear what is write UTF, how it works? UTF 8 encoding is clear. Fine. Okay, so now let's also have a look at the data output stream. Fine, we know we have seen the data input interface and the data input stream. The methods of data input stream are nothing but the all these methods of data input interface. Okay, so let's have a look at data input stream. So we have data input stream which implements the data input interface. Okay. We have what uh, constructor for data input stream. Let's see this. The constructor for data input stream, similar to the constructor of filter input stream, requires input stream. And then it implements the interface data input. Okay, methods point of view from data input. Fine, we understand methods of input stream. All those methods are available. Fine, reading a single byte. Uh, fine, read with just returns an int value, single byte or read into a byte array. Now, read into a byte array, we have a repeat of that again here coming in a different method name which is part of data input interface. So, we even have those two other methods. We have these, the methods are named as read fully. Parameter is a byte array. This is just like the read method with byte array. And, and read fully with segment of a byte array, integer offset and integer for the length. Read fully. Okay, two methods are read fully. Uh, I am not sure if it returns a int or a void. I think this returns void. Check that. Anyway. And might be throwing an exception, I/O exception. And if there is an end of file in between, should throw I/O exception. Interface. That's an interface. Data input is an interface. Okay. Other methods. And just like we had seen data output interface, right? We had seen those methods: write byte, write short. Those are methods of data output. 
but they were implemented in data output stream. Fine, same way, these are methods of data input implemented in data input stream. Okay. Fine. See, the idea is, yes, data input and data output are interfaces and could be implemented by some other classes also, right? It's not only this particular class. Okay. For example, we have a class called random access file and that implements both the interfaces, the data input and data output both. So, we'll have a look at that also. Fine. Okay. So, read fully and is overloaded. And then the other methods, yes, what are the other methods you like to have for handling primitive values? We have the method called read byte, no parameters requires, what does it return? Byte. We have the method called read short, no parameters returns short. Fine. We have read byte, read short. When, when I say byte, what's the range? What's the numeric range for byte? Minus 128 to plus 127. Fine, the byte is a signed value. Fine, sometimes you might have a requirement of saying, I would like to read it as an unsigned value. So, we have the method called read unsigned byte. And that would return a int. The int here is in the range from 0 to 255 now. Clear? Read byte also reads one byte. Read unsigned byte also reads one byte. The return types are different. Okay, because it's a int, 0 to 255 range is possible here. Okay, same way we also have the read unsigned short, read unsigned byte, read unsigned short to return int values, fine, they will return int values, fine, 16 bit unsigned value, okay. Other methods, fine, other primitive types, yes, byte short then yeah, we would have a method called read int. No parameter returns int. The methods here would not have parameters, okay? Read long. No parameters returns long. Read float. No parameter returns float. Read double. No parameter returns double value, read care, fine, without parameter returns care, read boolean, returns boolean. So, we have things which were returned by the write methods of the data output, their corresponding read methods are here. Fine. Primitive types. Fine. And as far as strings are concerned, we have got two methods only. Okay. Fine. So, one method is based on a delimiter. So, you have read line method to return a string. So, when you say read line from its current position, it keeps on reading till it comes across a new line. It would convert those bytes into a string into characters, right, by using default character set fine, and return a string. This method is deprecated, say do not use this method, instead you should use the buffered reader, okay, instead of data input streams read line method, you should try to use the buffered reader, buffered reader, that has also a read line method, but that is a reader, that is a string. It is a text stream meant for strings, okay. So, if you want to read line, try using the buffered reader. So, this method is a deprecated one, read line. And then the last one, read 
UTF returns a string. So, if you are at a place where a UTF string was written, this can read it out. Fine. Two bytes for the length and then the encoded bytes. If it that is the thing which is existing, yes, this read UTF can read it and create a string for us from the encoded UTF 8 encoded bytes. Creating a string is possible with this. That was encoding, this is decoding it. Fine. But of course, with the length being available there. Fine. So, yeah, that is what we have in the data output stream. Data input stream, sorry. Data input interface and data input stream, this is what we have. Clear? Fine, we have seen data output stream, data input stream, we have understood the UTF-8 encoding. Fine, okay. Now, let us look at one more class here. Fine, these are okay? Clear on this? Okay, fine. Now, let us look at one more class. This is nothing but the class called random access file. We have the class called random access file. The class random access file implements two interfaces. One is the data input and we have seen this interface, we have seen the methods, what methods are here and the other is data output. And these are both implemented by random access file. And in random access, yes, as far as a file is concerned, it is not something which, which is required that it should be read sequentially or it should be written sequentially only. And so that random access, fine, file always should have a, fine, it is possible for us to access file in random manner, right. You can seek to any position within the file, change your position, start your read and write operation anywhere. What are the read and write operations available? Data input, data output, they provide us with all the read and write methods. Both things, reading and writing, both are possible on single object. And in stream, no, we do not have that same thing in a single object. Right? And you might use the file input stream, oh, then it is only for reading. If you use the file output stream, it is only for writing. If it is a random access file, you can do read as well as write, and you can do a random access, fine, jumping around within the file anywhere, fine. Let us see the methods of random access file. I think, uh, okay, let us look at the constructor first, okay. So, random access file, fine. the constructor requires, uh, either you can use a string for the file name or you can call it as the path here. And second parameter is a string for the mode. This is O, mode. Okay. The value for mode more commonly can be R for read only mode or RW for read write mode. And these are the common values you might be using. When you open a file only for reading or you can open it for read as well as write. If your mode is R, fine. In that case, the methods of data output are going to throw exception. And methods of data output should throw exception. When I am not repeating the methods of data input, data output, we have just seen them. Fine, we understand those methods. Okay, let us look at the other methods, fine, which are for the purpose of random access. Reading, writing methods we know, right? We know the methods for reading and writing, okay? Read, byte, read, fine. Uh, read, byte, read, short, fine. Those are those methods. Read UTF, fine. Same way, write methods also. 
okay fine so the other methods of random access file in random access file it maintains your current position fine so we have a we call it as a file pointer so here we got a method called get file pointer returns long so that gives us what's the current value fine where within the file is the current position where the next i'll do a read or a write operation where will it be taking place from which position fine you want to change your file pointer position in that case we have a method called see parameter is a long the new value for the file pointer okay we have get file pointer we have a seek method fine seek to change the value of the file pointer fine you can know the size of the file so random access file also has a method called length to return long another method we have is a method called set length takes long the new value of the length the new size the new size for the file and return type is void so if you have opened a file as a random access file you can just cut it out or you can even extend it to whatever size you like you can just change the size allocate more space to it straight away and changing file size with the set length method is possible fine and then recollect one more thing there was something in the file input stream and the file output stream whenever we open a file for reading or writing you open a file for reading or writing what are we getting we have a file descriptor associated with the file any file if it is opened for reading or for writing a file descriptor is created for it okay so yes you want that file descriptor so we even have a method called get fd it returns file descriptor object fine so get fd returns a file descriptor similarly uh, just like the file input stream file output stream they had the method to get a channel fine which is useful with the nio package fine when we even have a method called get channel returns an object of file channel when get channel returns a file channel file channel is part of java.nio.channels this is part of java.nio. Channels. It's not in the Java.io. Okay, it's part of the NIO, the new IO. File channel. Then this method get channel is also there in the file input stream and the file output stream. It's a link between the IO and the NIO. Fine. Right? Your file operation. You you might have opened a file. you you can't directly just create a file channel by just having a file name or something fine what you can do is you can always create a file input stream a file output stream or a random access file and then switch to using the nio api by using the get channel method you get a file channel and then you can use the nio apis and so it's a link provided to start using the nio from and yes of course one of the methods yeah which we have is the method called close yeah we have the method called close returns void 
Okay. Fine. So this is what we have in the class called random access file. Other than this, oh, I have not mentioned those methods. Methods from this and the methods from here. All the read and write methods are here. Okay. Yeah, methods for reading and writing. Clear? Fine. Random access file. Okay. Now what remains is about object input and object output. Okay, we have the object input and the object outputs. Okay, fine. Uh, we'll have the object input seam and the object output seam. Fine, it takes time to cover those topics. So I think we'll continue tomorrow on that. Fine. So tomorrow we'll be looking at object seam.